I am sorry, sir, that I have hindered you, but I protest he had the chain of me, though most dishonestly he doth deny it. How is the man esteemed here in the city? A very reverend reputation, sir, of credit infinite, highly beloved, second to none that lives here in the city. His word might bear my wealth at any time. Speak softly, yonder, as I think as he walks. Tis so, and that self-chain about his neck, which he forswore most monstrously to have. Good sir, draw near to me, I'll speak to him. Signor Antiphilus, I wonder much that you would put me to this shame and trouble, and not without some scandal to yourself, with circumstance and oath so to deny this chain, which now you wear so openly. Beside the charge, the shame, imprisonment, you have done wrong to this my honest friend, who, but for staying on our controversy, had hoisted sail and put to sea today. You had this chain of me. Can you deny it? I think I had and never did deny it. Yes, that you did, sir, and forswore it too. Who heard me to deny it or forswear it? These ears of mine, thou knowest, did hear thee. Fie on thee, wretch! Tis pity that thou livest to walk where any honest man resort. Thou art a villain to impeach me, thus I'll prove mine honor and mine honesty against thou presently, if thou darest stand. I dare, and do defy thee for a villain. Hold! Hurt him not! For God's sake, he is mad! Some get within him! Take his sword away! Bind Dromeo too, and bear them to my house! Run, master, run! God's sake, take a house! This is some priory! In or we are spoiled! Quiet people, wherefore throng you hither? To fetch my poor distracted husband hence. Let us come in, that we may bind him fast and bear him home for his recovery. I knew he was not in his perfect wits. I am sorry now that I did draw on him. How long hath this possession held the man? This week he hath been heavy, sour, sad and much different than the man he was. But till this afternoon, his passion ne'er break into extremity of rage. Hoth he, he not lost much wealth by wreck of sea, buried some dear friend? Hath not else his eye strayed as affection in unlawful love, a sin prevailing much in youthful men who give their eyes the liberty of gazing? Which of these sorrows is he subject to? To none of these, except it be the last, namely some love that drew him oft from home. You should for that have reprehended him. Why, so I did. I, but not rough enough. As roughly as my modesty would let me. Haply in private and in assemblies too. I, but not enough. It was the copy of our conference. In bed he slept not for my urging it. At board he fed not for my urging it. Alone it was the subject of my theme. In company I often glanced at it. Still did I tell him it was vile and bad. And there rogue came it. The man was mad. The venom clamours of a jealous woman. Poisons more deadly than a mad dog's tooth. It seems my sleeps were hindered by thy railing, and therefore comes it his head is light. Thou says his meat is sourced with thy upbraidings. Unquiet meals make ill digestions. Thereof the raging fire of fever bred. And what's a fever but a fit of madness? Thou sayest his thoughts were hindered by thy brawls. Sweet, sweet recreation barred, what doth ensure but moody and dull melancholy? Kingsman to bring and comfortless despair. And at her heels a huge indigest in 
infectious troop of pale distemperatures and foes in life, in food, in sport and life preserving rest to be destruct. Would mad or man or beast? The consequence in then thy jealous fits have scared thy husband from the use of wits. She never reprehended him but mildly, when he demeaned himself rough, rude, and wildly. Why bear ye these rebukes and answer not? She did betray me to my own reproof. Good people, enter and lay hold on him. No, not a creature enters my house. Then let your servants bring my husband forth. Neither. He took this place for sanctuary, and it shall privilege him from your hands, till I have brought him to his wits again, or lose my labor in assaying it. I will attend my husband, be his nurse, die at his sickness, for it is my office, and I will have no attorney but myself, and therefore let me have him home with me. Be patient, for I will not let him stir till I have used the approved means I have. With wholesome syrups, drugs, and holy prayers, to make of him a formal man again, it is a branch and parcel of mine oath, a charitable duty of my order. Therefore depart, and leave him here with me. I will not hence, and leave my husband here, and ill it doth beseem your holiness to separate the husband and the wife. Be quiet and depart, thou shalt not have him. Complain unto the duke of this indignity. Come, go, I will fall prostrate at his feet, and never rise until my tears and prayers have won his grace to come in person hither, and take perforce my husband from the abyss. By this I think the dial points at five. Anon, I'm sure, the duke himself in person comes this way to the melancholy vale, the place of death and sorry execution behind the ditches of the abbey here. Upon what cause? To see Reverend Syracuse Merchant who put, unluckily, into this bay against the laws and statutes of the town, beheaded publicly for his offense. See where they come. We will behold his death. Kneel to the duke before he passed the abbey. Yet once again proclaim it publicly. If any friend should pay the sum for him, he shall not die. So much we tender him. Justice, most sacred duke, against the abbess. She is a virtuous and reverend lady. It cannot be that she hath done thee wrong. May it please your grace. Antipholus, my husband, whom I made lord of me and all I had, at your important letters, this ill day a most outrageous fit of badness took him that desperately he hurried through the street. With him his bondman, all as mad as he, doing displeasure to the citizens by rushing in their houses, bearing thence rings, jewels, anything his rage did like. Once did I get him bound and sent him home, whilst to take order for the wrongs I went that here and there his fury had committed. Anon I wot not by what strong escape he broke from those that had the guard of him, and with his mad attendant and himself, each one with ireful passion, with drawn swords, met us again, and madly bent on us, chased us away. Till raising of more aid, we came again to bind them. Then they fled into this abbey, whither we pursued them. And here the abbess shuts the gates on us, and will not suffer us to fetch him out, nor send him forth, that we may bear him hence. Therefore, most gracious duke, with thy command, let him be brought forth and borne hence for help. Long since thy husband served me in my wars, and I to thee engaged a prince's word when thou didst make him master of thy bed, to do him all the grace and good I could. Go, some of you. Knock at the abbey gate and bid the lady abbess come to me. I will determine this before I stir. Oh, mistress, mistress, shift and save yourself. 
My master and this man are both broke loose, beaten the maids around, and bound the doctor whose beard they have singed up with brands of fire as ever it blazed they threw on him great pails of putted mire to quench the hair. My master preaches patience to him, and while well, the man with scissors nicks him like a fool, and sure unless you send some present help between them they will kill the conjurer. Peace, fool. Thy master and his man are here, and that is false thou dost report to us. Mistress, upon my life I tell you true. I have not breathed almost since I did see it. He cries for you, and vows if he can take you to scorch your face and to disfigure you. Hark! Hark! I hear him, mistress! Fly! Be gone! Come, stand by me. Fear nothing. Guard, with halberds. Ay me! It is my husband. Witness you that he is born about invisible. Even now we housed him in the abbey here. And now he's there, past thought of human reason. Justice, most gracious duke, oh, grant me justice, even for the service that long since I did thee, when I bestered thee in the wars and took deep scars to save thy life, and even for the blood that I lost for thee. Grant me justice. Unless the fear of death doth make me dote, I see my son Antipholus, and Dromeo. <laughs> Just a sweet prince against that woman there, she whom thou gavest to me to be my wife, that hath abused and dishonored me even in the strength and height of injury. Beyond imagination is the wrong that she this day hath shameless thrown on me. Discover how, and thou shalt find me just. This day, great duke, she shut the doors on me, while she with harlots feasted in my house. A grievous fault. Say, woman, didst thou so? No, my good lord. Myself, he, and my sister today did dine together. So befall my soul, as this is False he burdens me withal. Ne'er may I look on day nor sleep on night, but she tells to your highness simple truth. O oh, perjured woman, they are both forsworn. In this the madman justly chargeth them. My liege, I am advised what I say. Neither disturbed with the effect of wine, nor heady rash provoked with raging ire, albeit my wrongs might make a one wiser mad. This woman locked me out this day from dinner. That goldsmith there, were he not packed with her, could witness it, for he was with me then, who parted with me to go fetch a chain, promising to bring it to the porpentine, where Balthazar and I did dine together. Our dinner done and he not coming thither, I went to seek him. In the street I met him, and in his company that gentleman. There did this perjured goldsmith swear me down that I this day of him received the chain, which God he knows I saw not, for which he did arrest me with an officer. I did obey, and sent my peasant home for certain ducats, and he with none returned. And then fairly I bespoke to the officer to go in person with me to my house. By the way, we met my wife, her sister, and a rabble more of vile confederates. Along with them they brought one pinch, a hungry, lean-faced, Villain, a mere anatomy, a mountebank, a threadbare juggler, and a fortune teller. A needy, hollow eyed, sharp looking wretch. A dead looking man, this pernicious slave, forsooth, took on him as a conjurer, and, gazing in mine eyes, feeling my pulse, and with no face as where out facing me cries out, I was possessed. Then altogether they fell on me, bound me, bore me thence, and in a dark and dankish vault at home there left me and my man, bound both together. Till knowing with my teeth my bonds in sunder, 
I gained my freedom and immediately ran hither to your grace, whom I beseech to give me ample satisfaction for these deep shames and great indignities. My lord, in truth thus far I witnessed with him that he dined not at home but was locked out. But had he such a chain of thee, or no? He had, my lord, and when he ran in here, these people saw the chain about his neck. Besides, I will be sworn these ears of mine heard you confess you had the chain of him after you first forswore it on the mart, and thereupon I drew my sword on you, and then you fled into this abbey here, from whence I think you are come by miracle. I never came within these abbey walls, nor ever didst thou draw thy sword on me. I never saw the chain, so help me heaven, and this is false you burden me withal. Why, what an intricate impeach is this? I think you all have drunk off Circe's cup. <laughs> if here you housed him, here he would have been. If he was mad, he would not plead so coldly. You say he dined at home. Well, the goldsmith here denies it. Uh, Sirrah, uh, what say you? Sir, he dined with her there at the porpentine. He did. And from my finger snatched that ring. Oh, tis true, my liege. Uh, this ring I had of her. And sourced you him enter at the abbey here. As Oh, my liege, that I do see your grace. Why, this is strange. <laughs> uh, go call the abbess hither. I think you are all mated. <laughs> or stark mad. Most mighty duke, vouchsafe me speak a word. Happily I see a friend will save my life and pay the sum that may deliver me. Speak freely, Syracusian, what thou wilt. Is not your name, sir, called Antiphilus, and is not that your bondman, Dromio? Within this hour I was his bondman, sir, but he, I thank him, gnawed into my cords. Now I am Dromio, and his man unbound. I am sure you both of you know me. Ourselves we do remember, sir, by you, for lately we are bound as you are now. You are not Pinch's patient, are you, sir? Why look you strange on me? You know me well. No, I never saw you in my life. Do now. Oh, grief hath changed me since you saw me last, and careful hours with time's deformed hand hath written strange defeatures in my face. But tell me yet, dost thou not know my voice? Neither. Dromeo, nor thou? No, trust me, sir, nor I. I am sure thou dost. I, sir, but I am sure I do not, and whatsoever a man denies, you are now bound to believe him. No, not my voice? O oh, time's extremity, hast thou so cracked and splitted my poor tongue in seven short years that here my only son knows not my feeble key of untuned cares? Though now this grained face of mine be hid in sap consuming winter's drizzled snow, and all the conduits of my blood froze up, yet hath my night of life some memory, my wasting lamp some fading glimmer left, my dull deaf ears a little used to hear, all these old witnesses I cannot err. Tell me, thou art my son Antiphilus. I never saw my father in my life. But in the seven years since, in Syracuse, boy, Thou knewest we parted, but perhaps, my son, thou shamest to acknowledge me in misery. The Duke and all that know me in the city can witness with me that it is not so. I ne'er saw Syracusa in my life. I tell thee, Syracusan, twenty years have I been patron to Antiphilus, during which time he ne'er saw Syracusa. I see thy age and dangers make thee doot. Most mighty duke, behold a man much wronged.
I see two husbands, or mine eyes deceive me. One of these men is genius to the other, and so of these, which is the natural man and which the spirit, who deciphers them? I, sir, am Dromeo, command him away. I, sir, am Dromeo, pray let me stay. A genius. Art thou not? Or else his ghost? Oh, my old master! Who hath bound him here? Whoever bound him, I will loose his bonds and gain a husband by his liberty. Speak, old Aegean, if thou beest the man that hadst a wife, once called Amelia, that bore thee at a burden two fair sons. Oh, if thou be that same Aegean, speak and speak unto the same Amelia. If I dream not thou art Amelia, if thou art she, tell me where is that sun that floated with thee on the fatal raft? By men of Epidamnum, he and I and the twin Dromeo were all taken up, but by and by rude fishermen of Corinth by force took Dromeo and my son from them and me they left with those of Epidamnum. What then became of them, I cannot tell. I to this fortune that you see me in. Why, here begins his morning story, right? These two Antipholuses, these two so like, and these two Dromeos, one in semblance. Besides her urging of her wreck at sea, these are the parents to these children, which accidentally are met together. Antipholus, thou camest from Corinth first? No, sir, not I. I came from Syracuse. Stay, stand apart. I know not which is which. I came from Corinth, my most gracious lord, and I with him. Brought to this town by that most famous warrior, Duke Menaphon, your most renowned uncle. Which of you two did dine with me today? I, gentle mistress, and are you not my husband? No, I say nay to that, and so do I, yet she did call me so. And this fair gentlewoman, her sister here, did call me brother. What I told you then, I hope I shall have leisure to make good, if this be not a dream I see and hear. That is the chain, sir, which you had of me. I think it be, sir. I deny it not. And you, sir, for this chain arrested me. I think I did, sir. I deny it not. I sent you money to be your bail by Dromeo. But I think he brought it not. No, none by me. This purse of ducats... I received from you and Dromeo, my man did bring them me. I see we still did meet each other's man, and I was tame for him and he for me. And thereupon these errors are arose. These ducats pawn I for my father here, and shall not need thy father hath his life. Sir! I must have that diamond from you. There, take it. And much thanks to my good cheer. Renowned Duke, vouchsafe to take the pains. To go with us to the Abbey here. And here at large decoursed all our fortunes. And all that are assembled in this place. That by this sympathised one day's error have suffered wrong. Go keep us company, and we shall make full satisfaction. Thirty-three years have I but gone in this travail. Of you, my sons, until this present hour, my heavy burden near delivers. The Duke, my husband, and my children both, and you, the calendars of their nativity. Go to a gossip's feast and go with me. After so long grief, such festivity, with all my heart, I'll gossip at this feast. Master, shall I fetch your stuff from shipboard? 
Dromeo, what stuff of mine hast thou embarked? Your goods that lay at host, sir, on the centaur. He speaks to me. I am your master, Dromeo. Come, go with us. We'll look to that anon. Embrace thy brother there, rejoice with him. There is a fat friend at your master's house that kitchened me for you today at dinner. She shall be my sister, not my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Methinks you are my glass and not my brother. I see by you I am a sweet-faced youth. <laughs> Will you walk in to see their gossiping? Not I, sir. You are my elder. That's a question. How shall we try it? We'll draw cuts for the senior. Till then, leave you first. Nay, then thus. We came into the world like brother and brother. Now let's go hand in hand, and not one before the other. 